Okay, this is the first ever, hopefully the start of a tradition, uh, Indies uh, Hangover Cure Indies Rant. And the first surprise is we're going to add a second tradition within this. So you've got five rants to think of your own topic. And if somebody wants to be our guest ranter, I will ask for hands at about the five rant mark. I'll ask for a quick topic if we've got more than one. If we've got more than three or four, I may pick a couple, but I want to hear a couple topics, and then you'll get the mic for a couple minutes if you want to do a spontaneous rant. Okay? So our first presenter, I do have cards that I'm going to work from, and this, I'm hoping, sets the tone. He just flew in from Berkeley, and boy, are his arms tired. Tim Johnson, and he's going to rant about the dark side of accessibility which we like to call the next big thing lie. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I, I went to bed really early last night, so, <clears throat> so pardon this. Endypocalypse is a clickbaity bullshit lie. <laughs> one graph, one graph. You may have the greatest shoe salesman in the world. You go to him, you trust him, her, right? Would you really trust them to read your chest CT scan? So why are we trusting English majors with statistical analysis? I'm sorry, I don't. Correlation does not equal causation. That is, that is, a, a, well, I say a fact. Ha! There's no facts. I say a fact. Did you know that for the past 20 years there's been a direct correlation between the age of Miss America and the annual number of murders by steam, <laughs> hot vapor, or hot objects. It's true. I've been telling everyone for years and no one's doing anything about it. So what is this? Uh, accessibility. Accessibility makes our industry great. Having anyone be able to jump in and do anything is a fantastic way to, to grow an industry. And we're not the first. This is nowhere near new. Music industry, are you kidding? I mean, it used to be like, oh, we well, have to go and have to get a producer, you have to go to a studio and all that. No, no, you just need Fruity Loops. You don't even need to know how to play an instrument. You could record a high fidelity album on your phone and market it and distribute it all from your phone now. Where am I going with this? Movie industries before that. Blair Witch Project? I know, everyone, oh, st yeah, whatever. It made like $2 billion. It took like 175000 to make. It was all on credit cards. Accessibility makes an industry worse at first to people who have been in it. Porn industry. All right, we're going to go here. <laughs> 1970s, there used to be a story. It used to be shot on 16 millimeter. You wanted to know what happened. Inner VHS, every person with a camera is just shooting stuff in their basement. Porn's never been bigger. Where am I going? Accessibility makes an industry seem shitty at first because everyone jumps into it. But, uh, you know, it, it goes and grows. It contracts. It expands. People that are serious about it make it better eventually. You have lulls. You have you know, just feast and famine. It's just the way markets work. Which is going to bring me to Indiepocalypse. What is that? I'm gonna, this might piss some people off. <laughs> I think there's a very big difference between an indie developer and what I'm just going to say is an amateur. What's the difference between a hobbyist and an indie? Well, the first one is you take it seriously. If you don't understand it is an industry, industry equals business, business equals money. If you don't take it seriously, then, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Please, go make things, Please make a lot of things. But if you don't treat it as if you actually opened a Dunkin' Donuts on the corner, how are you going to get people to come in and buy your donuts? Trust me, there's lots of broke Dunkin' Donuts owners out there who have folded it up. In fact, almost one, one in every three, one out of every three small businesses makes it after three years. Two will close. So that is where my rant is. And Apocalypse is a lie because there are a lot of people in there who rightfully so want to make games, want to be part of it, but you need to grow a little bit. You need to get into the idea this is an industry. And as soon as you take yourself seriously, as soon as you realize, okay, this, whatever I'm doing is probably going to fail, pick yourself up, do it again. You're probably not going to make a lot of money for a very long time. If you could just make any money, if you can get one person in front of your game, that's amazing. And keep going with it. So Indiepocalypse, fuck that. <laughs> hey, great job. So to me, 
I, I, I have to, I, I have to, I have to. <laughs> so I'm not taking responsible, responsibility for that because the group panel voted him to go first and they were idiots because that's a tough act to follow right there, okay? But our next presenter, you may have heard our next, pre and I'm sticking with the lame jokes, okay? So you may have heard our next ranter was recently abducted by aliens, but that would be incorrect. People that know her better know <laughs> she was just print snapped. Our next presenter is <laughs> Molly Prophet with the one star rant review, also known as The Fair and Balanced Lie. All right. I've been making mobile games for four years, and arguably the worst relationship I ever have had is the one I have at the App Store. Um, I don't know if, how many of you make mobile games or have actually released a mobile game. Okay, how many of you have ever received a one-star review? Which should be every one of you, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm not gonna read you any of my reviews, but I will say that the first time I got one that had a, <laughs> had a user say, I think the NSA is using your game to collect information on a word game was when I realized that the App Store is pretty damn broken. Um, <laughs> so, I have some choice reviews that I would like to share because I think they're hilarious of games that we all love. So how many of you have played Monument Valley? Okay, it's, it's a beautiful game. It's arguably one of my favorite games. I know the developers on it and I love that game. It costs $4. Here's one of my favorite reviews from that game. It's called What the Hell? <laughs> and the guy's name is just a bunch of letters. Overpriced, short game, don't like the main character. Can't we just play a puzzle game that doesn't have an agenda? I'm trying to remember the last time that a game I made had any kind of agenda. Um, well, I guess Prince Snapped is, has a little bit of an agenda, but it's okay. Um, the other one that I got from this game, which is gorgeous, was too much, four bucks for 10 levels. Four bucks is how much a Starbucks costs. Four bucks is less than a movie. It's actually about half as much as a movie. If it takes you three hours to play that game, you've already got more money. I mean, you've already got your money's worth. And I can't believe that the App Store has come down to this level where the expectations of the games that we make and love cost us so much to make, but users have no fucking appreciation for that level of effort. <laughs> yeah, that too. Although, I, and I, like at first, I had, uh, I went through stages with this over the four years. At first I was like, is this our fault? Did we get ourselves here? Was it like, Fruit Ninja and Angry Birds and us releasing all this free shit to people and saying, here's all the free stuff you get, now play our game. Is this our fault? Did we bring ourselves here? Then I realized it's not our fault. Oh, and I don't want to talk bad about Apple because like that's the best way to not get featured on your next app. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh, right. But there's, there's a little bit of accountability that needs to be happen, that needs to happen with the review system. Because right now, I don't know if any of you guys know this, it's just, you know, just five stars, just give it five stars. And so instead, people will use it to do things like, let's see, this is one of my favorite ones. Does anyone ever win a legendary bear with the treasure events, a total waste of coins on Alpha Bear? So they gave them one star. <laughs> Tim, had, you said this great. He called them ransom reviewers, or reviewer ransomers. Basically, <laughs> when you use the review space to ask for another feature, shit. <laughs> what? Okay, thanks, Joe. Anyway. All I'm saying is I really wish we had a better review system so that we can get somewhere with our applications without losing our spots in the App Store. Users are so critical to us and to keep our games going, but out the gate you can, you can just lose it because people don't use the App Store in the way that the initial developers of the review system thought they would use it. They use it to ransom for features. They use it to, they're, well, there's just plain crazy people. They, <laughs> we also have paid farmers. I don't know if, if anyone's familiar with that, but that we're, it's very hard to compete against uh, farmers who just pay to review apps. I, it's crazy. They allowed too many clones on the store, which is a Flappy Bird should never have happened in terms of that entire system. I'm sure a bunch of lawyers have looked at that and been like, what the fuck? Um, so <laughs> we just need a better process, and I encourage anyone who would like to see the review system change so that we can get to a point where people care, please speak out and don't let me be the only one. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. Okay, we're gonna move quickly. The artist formerly known as Prince couldn't be here today, 
So instead, we have the artist, currently known as Ron Jones, the artist, with the starving artist rant. Or for all you romantics out there, the love conquers all lie. <laughs> so, how many of you guys out there love me? Thank you. Thank you. I was, thank you. You get a prize. I got some prizes actually for you. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> obviously you're at this you're at this ramp because you're somewhat familiar with the term indie or indep independent developer, artist, all that good jazz. Hopefully you you guys are one. If you are, then you know most of this. You know some of this, something like that. Are you going through all these experiences just to uh, just to just to infuriates you when you when you know that you're you're struggling you're trying hard you're you're sleepless nights just to work a day job have your boss curse you out just to be like I'm making a game fuck you kind of thing <laughs> and it's like all of that all of that just to when when you get around your peers have these these little um, I guess tendencies and and things that you hate about the, the next person, the next indie, and it's like, if you do that better, then it's like, they would stop judging me. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm just ranting, obviously. <laughs> but anyway, so just a couple of lists, uh, a list to, I guess, we can uh, check each other on and everything like that. First of all, I need everyone to be able to stay connected. Look people in the eye, handshake, all that good stuff. This is like, Entrepreneur 101, we all gotta, I don't know, carry, carry bar of soap and deodorant for everybody. We all know that one. So you know, you don't even have to say nothing, just like, yeah, what's up, brother? Follow him, just, <laughs> so it's all good. Basically, we just gotta help each other out. That's one, of, that's one of the things, and it's not like it's everybody or anything, but you know, we all know it's, it's just something we all deal with. Play testing when it comes to People giving, giving us reviews and talking about our games and stuff like that. Just if someone tells you this is awful, then punch them in the face. <laughs> you have my permission to punch them in the face. That's like <laughs> terrible. What kind of review is that, you know? That's like what Molly was saying about the one star review. That's, that's worse than that. Actually, what's worse than that is saying this is great because that's no feedback at all. That's just saying like, yeah, you know, you did a good job, you know, jacking off on this. and. Good job, you, you succeeded. So basically, <laughs> we, need, <laughs> we need people to use adjectives. We need them to go into stories and depths. Why is this good? Why is this great? What does this mean to you? Basically going, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> it's, it's hard out there, you know. When I'm saying no, no money, no support, no love from, from the world. And this is just like face-to-face -face interactions. When you get on, when you get on the internet, it's worse because it's cold. And it's especially when your power's off, then it's like, it's not there, but it is there. <laughs> so when you, when, you go from, when you go from eating uh, peanut butter and sugar sandwiches for two weeks and beer, that's all, that's your diet for two weeks, you know you like, you reached that point. <laughs> Everyone has a turning point in their life, <laughs> you know? You reach that point, and now it's like, okay, I, I just gotta, <laughs> just gotta survive the next day, and get that one person to, uh, to, to review my game, to not get punched in the face, to stay connected with me, to build this brand, build your own brand, build your own community, and you know, love when all, love conquers all. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, nice job. Okay, moving right along. She swears she's no longer living in an ivory tower, but her topic is fit for a PhD thesis. Here's Renee Michelle Blair discussing, hopefully ranting a little bit, the intellectual slash academia versus entertainment in games, or simply the dichotomy lie. All right. All right, so um, I'm going to be talking about accessibility, but definitely uh, with a different definition. So um, for anyone who's talked to me at all, I like to like 
bitch and moan about how I got a master's degree in human computer interaction and now I'm dead inside. Um, so in uh, HCI, uh, we think of accessibility as in people with different um, disorders and disabilities and whatnot are able to use an interface or some piece of technology. Um, so for my master's thesis, I did an accessible game for students who are visually impaired and my whole thing was um, usability testing and giving design recommendations and whatnot. And um, so I was presenting this in front of a bunch of like super incredibly smart literal rocket scientists. Um, and it was like stats are fine, research method is fine, but I had to spend my entire um, presentation describing super basic game design stuff. Like I had to spend a half hour um, explaining that games have evolved beyond Pac-Man and Grand Theft Auto, like there's a middle ground there. Um, so like one of the studies I told them about like why this is important to me is um, PopCap pretty, in the past couple of years did, um, like funded some research that found 20% of casual gamers identify as having a disability. So physical, mental, um, developmental, and that is compared to 15% of the general population. So there are more people like percentage wise with disabilities playing casual games. And a big portion of these people reported that they played these games because their doctors recommended it helped with stress, depression, um, physical problems, um, helped with like chronic pain, things like that. Um, and I found like organizations like Able Gamers and whatnot that are kind of like giving awards to games like Bayonetta and Dragon Age and whatnot because they have like, um, like Bayonetta, you can play pushing one button. Dragon Age, you can play if you're colorblind or like you, it has subtitles, it has um, like, you can play in real time or you can pause if you need a second to think about the combat. All kinds of super cool stuff. But anyway, so back to my, my um, thesis presentation. So my friends in, in the research world um, know nothing about these things. Like this is all new to them. People who fucking make rockets and airplanes and shit, they're like, what, you, like you can put subtitles in a game? I don't understand. Um, and then on the flip side, game devs, I'm about to make fun of you. Um, so I was talking to some friends of mine and I was like, again, like talking about how I have no soul because master's degree. Um, and I was telling them like, oh yeah, all these alternative inputs, like, um, like what is it, the suck blow tube and eye tracking and um, like measuring like muscle twitches and whatnot. And they thought I was making like a weird perverted joke about like how Stephen Hawking's computers work so he can like make books. I was like, like, no, like I did not make up the term suck blow just to make a gross joke. Like I'm talking about like a real life interface. <laughs> yeah, and it's like the same people are like, do you even know how to code? And it's like, no, do you even know like how to do something with like something beyond a keyboard and a mouse? Um, anyway, so what I'm getting to is um, when I'm designing a game, I think about these things. I mean, sometimes I think about like, do I want it to be accessible? Do I want to consider these different disorders and et cetera, et cetera. But also it's cool things to think about when you're thinking about like novel mechanics or novel input, things like that. Like it informs your, uh, your practice and like how to make a game that's a little more extraordinary and a little more thoughtful when you think about research and you think about the world outside of game development. And likewise, when I'm doing my like academic bullshit, it's helpful to think about like, what do people actually give a shit about? Like when I was talking to kids about my study, like all of them, every single one of these kids said like they play games. Kids who are totally blind were telling me that they play Angry Birds with their siblings. So I don't know, maybe we should make it so they can. Maybe we should make it a little easier for them so they don't need their whole family helping them play a game. And if you have other academic interests, you know, use those in your game development practice. If you like microbiology, I don't know, make like ant sim. So. That is my story. Nice job. I just want to say in the moment, this has exceeded my expectations. I'm just really happy right now. Okay, so when he is not in an altered state of consciousness or just totally confused, he's better known as Charlie Hawkins. He's here to talk to you today about the early access lie. And since he's already got lie in his title, there is no alternate title. Thank you. Okay, I'm, so I am an independent video game review um, journalist. And for the love of God, please, 
don't support early access. Okay, I know that there 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 are individuals out there who actually use early access the right way. It's like two percent of the population. Early access basically means we ran out of money. Please, please fund us so we could kind of maybe possibly make our game. And oh, by the way, thanks for paying to QA our game. Um, one thing that you have to understand about early access is that does not guarantee you the game. Holy crap. That's a novel concept. The game's not done. If not enough people early access with you, it's never going to be done. And you're never going to get your money back, by the way. Um, <clears throat> by supporting this type of thing, you're making it okay to throw a concept up and then people pay for it. And then more people jump into it and you get more shittier and shittier and shittier games. And the next thing you know, Steam is flooded by shit and you'll never find the awesome games that are out there. But I know a lot of people out there are like, but I, but, but I don't have the money and I need the feedback. There are other ways to get feedback. It's called talking to people. I understand that Steam is a great place for you to throw your stuff up there and walk away and chances are people are gonna find it because they're curious. Huh, that sounds like a weird way of putting all three of those genres that have nothing to do together. But if you actually show some love and support for your game. People are going to go want, want to go get it. Um, so, if you want to do early act, if, if you really are dying for money because you don't have enough, do Kickstarter. And I understand, yes, Kickstarter is bad. Um, yes, it, there, there are very bad people. There are people who have disappeared with $70,000. But here's the thing. If you have this amazing idea and people actually support it and they pledge that money at the end and you actually make your goal and please keep your um, please keep in mind the stretch goals are supposed to be achievable not like um, double fine adventure <laughs> double fine adventure raised like what 3.8 million dollars and by the time they ran through all 3.8 million dollars they had an alpha um, a pretty alpha um, and then they had to break it up into two chapters so um, please, please, for the love of God, if you're an independent developer and you're going to make a game, mark everything out. Like, figure out how much it's really going to cost. Not, well, I could do it on a shoestring budget, because you'll never do it on a shoestring budget. Always be prepared to <clears throat> hit those bumps in the road. And please, Support the indies who actually know what they're doing. <laughs> huh? Okay. Yeah, I, I, dude, I am. I'm, I, you motherfuckers, please, God. You got Flappy Birds. You got, you got all these games that are clones, but you have so am many amazing games out there that are getting left unknown uh, because there's so many clones. There's so many shits. There's, they're shitty games, and of course, there's so many sequels and reboots and all that stuff and I would really love for people to support games that are original so that we can actually go away from Call of Duty 37.5 and um, I would say something about EA but I think I'm actually getting off of EA's bad list so I'm not gonna say anything so thank you please please for the love of God louder applause for Charlie please um. So quickly, raise your hands if you got a rant. If you want to be part of the spontaneous rant, don't let me down. Come on. Okay, appa apparently you want to hear about the horse that played baseball. I'll tell a joke. I'll tell a joke, really. What's your topic? You got two minutes. Okay. Introduce yourself, please. Hi. My name is Leanne Kennison, and I am the president of Miss Flame Studios. But up until last month, I was working as a producer at Cartoon Network Games. And um, I've produced a lot of, of mobile games. And uh, we've gotten some lovely one-star reviews. My favorite comment for one of my games was, Poop! <laughs> okay, thanks. I think. I don't know. Um, but what we did find is um, people don't want to pay for games. Um, this probably doesn't surprise any of you who may have actually tried to put a game on the mobile market. Um, 
do you know how much work it takes to make a game? Do you know how many people it takes to make a game? Do you know how many people it takes to test a game, to market a game, to get all this stuff done? And then you get it out there, and maybe you even get featured by Apple. Please, Apple, please. Um, but nobody wants to pay for your game. Um, and so you, know, you do free games, and you put ads in there. Or you do freemium games, and you're like, please, buy our IAP. And it's horrible, because, because people get mad. <laughs> and they're like, how dare you put ads in this free game? <laughs> like, I don't want to have to watch an ad. I don't want to pay for the game either. And uh, no, I'm not going to buy your, your stuff that you've worked on. I don't care. And that's really frustrating. And then what, what really, really makes me more upset, I think, is we do this too. People who make games don't want to pay for games. And it's like, come on, you, of all people, know how much work goes into making a game. Could you please just like shell out four bucks? It, it is, really is. It's, it's less than the cost of my Starbucks, because I get the fancy ones. So mine are actually five bucks. But um, come on, we can pay like $3 for a game. We could pay $4 for a game. Honestly, I would pay $10 for a game. Back back when I was a kid, like in the 80s when I was wanting to make games, they used to cost like 60 or 70 bucks. And that was like in the 1980s when that was actually a lot of money. So <laughs> I mean, come on, we can we can we can shell out a few dollars for a game. And that's my rant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. So I said to this next um, this next lady's mom, I said, oh, she's one of the nicest pe people I know. Uh, and her mom replied, and this is serious. It was through Facebook, but she did reply. She said, unless you get her angry. So that's what we're about to do. Let's find out what makes Ashley angry. Uh, and here's Ashley. Her uh, full name is Ashley Amring. And I don't actually understand her rant. It's called the big ball of mud over engineering rant. I'm hoping I understand you know, in the next four minutes. But we, I've subtitled it the design is set in stone lie. And I'm hoping that's semi-accurate since I really don't know what her rant's about, so. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so bear with me because this is a hangover rant and I might have a hangover. Um, <laughs> and thank you for talking to my mom. She, she was the one that told me <laughs> that you had that conversation. Um, but yeah, bear with me. This is my first talk about a specific topic either, so might be a little bit drawn out. Um, anyways, big ball of mud, um, just to give you a better understanding of that. I don't know if any of you, raise of hands, who's programmers in the room? Or has programmers in the room? Okay, a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> so you might understand working in a system that is just like a big pile of shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> And whenever I say that, I don't mean that the system's been there for 10 years, 20 years. The system might have been made over the weekend during a game jam. <laughs> and it's had multiple programmers touching it. Maybe there was an architecture in the beginning, but it's just slowly fallen apart. And later on, well, for instance, I'm not an indie developer, but I'm on this rant maybe because I'm an indie developer mindset and I love making games on my own, so. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, whenever I get asked to work on something specific, like implement this feature and yeah, it took, you know, like 30 minutes to do, like two years ago, it should take you 30 minutes, it should be fine. They don't understand that this system has been overhauled and has gone through a lot of bad architecture decisions to solve complex problems that nobody had planned for. And it ends up taking you like two or three days to do something like this. And then that cuts down on the QA time because it wasn't properly planned out, et cetera. Um, like I said, I'm drawing on a hangover. Bear with me. Um. <laughs> But honestly, at the end of the day, who cares if the code looks like shit or if it takes a long time to implement because th that's just on the back end. And if it works and it works well, then good for them for being able to implement it in this big pile of shit. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I'm going to keep going. I have, <laughs> I have lots of things to talk about with this. Um, okay, good. Um, Anyways, well, I'll tell you the actual definition of a big ball of mud. Also called a shanty town or spaghetti code or whatever. It has lots of dead code in it. But it's unregulated growth and repeated expedient repair. 
Um, trust your programmers that they know what they're doing, but be lenient with them and let them, give them time to undo those knots. Because sustained commitment to refactoring is a thing. And the longer that you don't give your programmers time to refactor the system and work around this architecture, and don't trust them to make it super modular and so that it could work with every system. We, we can't predict every problem that's gonna come up and every design decision that's gonna be made. But, but yeah, it's, it's complex and it's a problem that needs to be solved and you can either refactor a whole system later on and spend months of not implementing any features, or you could, there's, there's multiple different ways to do this. Currently, we're in the process of overhauling a massive system, and we have to be honest with our producers. You're not gonna get anything for us, from us. But, um, but yeah, that's basically my rant. Big ball of mud, let us program, give us time, and understand that what we're working in can be really hard and a lot harder than it was two years ago, a year ago, 30 minutes ago, realistically, <laughs> with a lot of programmers touching it. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. A uh, brief reminder to all the speakers to try to use the mic so that the, the recording of it uh, comes out a little better. Um, okay, so. For this next person, um, I was going to do a lame Michael Jordan reference, um, but it turns out after meeting him, he's one of the smartest, nicest guys that I really had the pleasure to meet this weekend. So direct from the Windy City, the home of your Chicago Bulls, we have Ron Williams. <laughs> Talking about the dynamics of business relations or don't mix business with pleasure lie. All right, so first of all, the first lie is my topic, all right? I completely <laughs> lied about that just to get up here, right? No, actually, I just talking to people over this conference over the weekend, you know, I've learned a lot of stuff. I've listened to a lot of people talk about bad leadership. What a surprise, right? And one thing that really bothers me about bad leadership and bad teamwork is, is it, it's counterintuitive, it's counterproductive for getting to a vision or a goal, right? We're supposed to be a team. We're supposed to work together, especially in small indie teams. Like, there should be no better group of people to work together, right? We're doing this because of the passion. We're doing it because of the love of things. And we need to share that love with each other, with our teammates, right? Because we're spending a lot of time just trying to make deadlines, trying to get the game out. And we have all these business decisions in mind because, yes, this is a business still. We talked about that earlier, right? This is still a business. We do have to get things done. But... And I'm a producer. If anybody <laughs> understands deadlines and getting things done, that's me. But at the same time, we need to spend a little bit more time just understanding what it is that our fellow teammates are working on, understand what they're doing, and be able to give them adequate time. Because there's so much churn that happens right now within the industry, within teams, of people just having to go back and redo the same thing over and over again because of poor communication, because of not enough time being given up front, so now they have to go back and fix the mistakes that they made because the big ball of spaghetti, all of that stuff, you know? We need to spend a little bit more time understanding what it is that each discipline that we don't do does. Let's spend some time with one another. Let's get to know what they're doing. Let's get to know their workflow and their process so that we can adequately make a game, adequately have a good code base, adequately have the teamwork and the camaraderie um, in development. I'm going to cut it off short because <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really passionate about this, but it's, it's really bothering me that we're spending a little bit too much time being at each other's throats instead of just working together and continuing to bring this passion, bring something that's awesome and fun into the world, and, and we're not having fun doing it ourselves anymore. Let's get back to having fun making games and bring that fun and have that transfer to our players. Thank you, Ron. Okay, so from uh, Glass Lab Games, sorry, Glass Lab Games, and my alma mater, by the way. She's a, she's a fellow graduate of RPI. You, you know, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute? Georgia Tech of the North? Come on. 
Really, we are. Georgia Tech of the North. That's how I, I've always thought of myself back then. Wanted to go to Georgia Tech, couldn't, you know. So, anyways, um, it is truly my pleasure to introduce Aaron Hoffman. I, I, okay, I'm going to say your title. What if you gave a fuck? And I nicknamed it the rather weak, the escape lie. Hi. Uh, this is a prepared rant. You might want to leave if you're afraid of bad language. Um, so what are the white and brown creatures that Mario stomps on in the first level of Super Mario Brothers? Goombas. <laughs> Fucking Goombas. Okay? I will assert that that is the single most useless piece of information that exists, and there it is, lodged in your brain for eternity. What does Sonic the Hedgehog collect? Rings! Jesus fucking Christ. Okay, so here are five facts that, if widely known, would change the fucking world. Uh, number one, 70% of incarcerated people today cannot read above a third grade level. Third grade. In this country, we imprison people with ignorance. When I learned this, I quit the highest paying job I've ever had and started a company to educate through games. Two, if the global temperature rises uh, beyond four degrees cents Celsius, above pre-industrial levels. We face the inundation of U.S. coastal cities, extinction of coral reefs, unprecedented drought, and the associated water wars, the disappearance of Greenland, and most fun, the potential mitigation method of scouring the skies with sulfur dioxide to create a protective atmospheric layer, which would mean that no child born after 2081 would ever see a blue sky again. Three, in 1877, the Black Hills were literally, literally stolen from the Lakota Sioux. Straight up fucking stolen. The United States acknowledges that the land were stolen, and in 2012, a UN representative recommended they be given back. But they haven't been given back, and no Lakota has accepted a single dollar of the $400 million buyout that the US has offered uh, to fix it. They want their land back instead. Number four, the United States leads the world in mass incarceration with over 2.4 million people in prison today. More than 60% of them are people of color. Incarceration is up 500% over the past 30 years and now fed by for-profit pr super prisons who financially benefit from depriving people of every right that they have. Imprisonment of women rose 837% from 1997 to 2007. Including in these populations is over 97,000 children below 18. And we know how to stop it. Five, uh, every plastic is thrown <laughs> enough plastic is thrown away each year to circle the earth four times. This translates into billions of pounds of plastic in our oceans and to a staggering 93% of Americans age six or older testing positive for the plastic chemical BPA in their bodies, which recent studies have shown could impact the human nervous system. And 50% of plastic we use is used once and then thrown away. What would happen if you all gave a fuck? Just one solitary fuck. The obliteration of the sky should be a controversy. The mass imprisonment of 2.4 million people should be a concert controversy. Whatever the fuck Nintendo does with its hardware is our controversy. Game developers are my people, but you all frustrate the shit out of me because you don't realize that you're among the most powerful people on Earth. Game developers are the most powerful people in the world because they are the bards of our time, the message carriers. They can take a stupid, useless, beautiful idea and implant it in the brains of millions of people with a single, immortal, infinitely distributable, infinitely replicable creation. As bards, we have a responsibility. The music industry knows this. Where is our Woodstock? Where is our Lilith Fair? Where is our fucking Rock the Vote? Are we really the terrible, soulless, greedy bastards that Jack fucking Thompson thinks we are? Today you can swim in the Hudson River, and that is because Pete fucking Seeger got on a boat in it and sang songs. He sang to draw the public's attention to the river. He asked them to clean it up, and they did. There's a fucking Wikipedia page on music and politics. There is no fucking Wikipedia page on video games and politics. We think of ourselves and even celebrate ourselves as escapists, but the escape is a lie. None of us are escapists because none of us can escape. You are here, you live here, and human society as a whole has a whole lot of waking up that it isn't doing. As bards, that is on us, ladies and gentlemen. What if you gave a fuck? What a world this could be. That really pissed me off because I am the next speaker, okay? And I have to follow that, so that, that just sucks. So, however, however, okay. Um, I'm taking my glasses off because I, I read better with them off, and I'm going to read a little bit more. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, really, before my final, our final speaker, I'd like to take a short break from ranting and speak to you all about a sensitive topic. Privilege. 
and how it affects the game industry. The actual title of this non-rant will come towards the end, but the alternative title is the My Point of View is Special Lie. And I'm seriously, although I'm gonna rant a little bit, I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to offend anybody at all. But I came from, I, lived, I grew up in New Hampshire. I did not meet a person of color until my senior year in high school. I did not know I went to school with a Jewish person until I was in college and thought back and went, wow, Helen's Jewish. Never knew that. Um, our jokes growing up were, whether you were, you know, there were the Italians, the French, the Polish jokes, and they all had a characteristic, but I was three quarters French, one quarter Irish, and I didn't think of myself as those characteristics at all. In fact, when I think back on my childhood, the, the angriest memory I have is when I was in college thinking back on my childhood, going, wow, the Brady Bunch, that's, that was my life. That's a pretty normal freaking show. Now as an adult, I go, Jesus Christ, how the hell, how the hell did I think that was normal, okay? Um, but that's where I came from. I love the GGDA, I love Siege, I love the, I love the Atlanta community. I've been here six years now. And working out of my home, this has been a lifesaver. And it's been a lesson in diversity for me beyond the rest of my adult years, which were definitely much more diverse than my, my childhood. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been Gamergate, there's a lot of talk about privilege, there's the whole big global, global and issues. But the, we had an expression in the 70s which was, think globally, act locally. And I just want to tell you how this is sort of I survive in the world. I'm kind of an apolitical person. Erin um, would probably really hate me if she got to know me. Although I vote, I'm sort of apolitical. I'm definitely part of the problem. But I also believe I can affect the world by just touching, you know, individuals. And I don't mean that way, so. <laughs> <laughs> but in a small circle of influence. And while doing this rant, or getting ready for this rant, Again, I think, think globally, act locally, and to me that means, again, I'm just a single player in this big video game of life. And I can't save the starving kids over in China and Africa, and I know jokes about them that are offensive, but they're still sort of funny, you know. But we're not gonna go there at all. Um, I keep my sanity because I don't believe I can affect the world. I actually believe Aaron probably can affect the world, and that's a good thing, and we have people like Aaron, but I'm not one of those. So all I can do is my own sort of sphere of influence. And again, the last couple of years, we have Gamergate, all this talk about privilege, and to try to set this tone for this rant, I wrote this little poetry slam that originally I didn't think I was gonna do, and originally I thought I was gonna improve it, and I decided to leave it as is. And about the only thing you have to really understand about it is you have to know what the word privy means. Does anybody know what the word privy means? So who knows what a privy is and tell me. Go ahead, tell me. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an outhouse in the Old West. That's the way I think of it. Okay, and the, this, this poem is called, um, and no beatboxing, please, Michelle. This is called Falling Off the Privy Ledge. I was originally gonna drop the mic at the end, but and I don't have any matches, but we're just doing this, so. This is called, again, Falling Off the Privy Ledge. And I think of this as, by the way, just because cultural appropriation is also a big thing, like with Miley Cyrus and all that stuff. I don't think of this as that, although I call it a poetry slam. To me, it's the 60s beatniks kind of thing going on, if you remember what that was like at all. So, sure, sure. <laughs> so this is called Falling Off the Privy Ledge. Privilege, feeling privileged, feeling the privy ledge, falling off that privy ledge, trapped in a small shed, ready to jump off, pissed off at who you think I am, who you think I am, I am, old man, Nerd, geek, vim type and fool. A book in its cover. Who sees individuals, not groups.
privilege applies only to groups. Privilege, uh, privilege applies to only groups. Only groups that only allow some people. But I ain't some people. I am just me. And I don't care about groups. I care about individuals. Individuals that are doers, not talkers. Individuals that create something. Individuals that create anything. Individuals that are indies. Indies that create. Jump off that privy ledge. No excuses. No whining. Take no prisoners. Finish that game. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Michelle. She just might be that the hippest, the hippest game developer cat on the planet. And I'm sure she's going to rant for a bit. Just don't call her grumpy, because then she'd be a grumpy cat, and we can't have that. So here's Michelle Menard, <laughs> sorry for the private jokes, uh, closing with derailing the internet wine mobile, the it's not trolling when I say it lie. <laughs> Take as long as you want. All right, I read the internet comments so you don't have to. And trigger warning, trigger warnings, you know, if you don't feel uncomfortable by the end of me reading this list, you are a broken human being. Why are games so bad at representing other cultures? I don't even know where to start with that loaded, dumbass, generalized sentence. Video games only imitate the kind of tragedies that men want to fantasize about. Candy Crush is a tragedy that men want to fantasize about? Really? <laughs> okay, sure. I think it's just adorable how absolutely no girls are any good at video games, just like how no woman has ever written a good novel. The first novel was written by a woman, fuck you. There's no such thing as sexism against men, fuck you, not, that's not true at all. Tards are a cancer that prevent any normal fags from sympathizing with us. I don't even know what that means. It just sounds bad. If you look at the industry's hiring practices as a whole, they are tilted very, very severely against women. What? That is one of the most atrocious, overgeneralized bullshit statements I have ever had the mispleasure of reading on the interwebs. Video games are toys for developmentally stunted adult men. I'm so sorry to every adult man in this room. Wow. Video games do not have the same artistic potential as film. Fuck you. Goddamn, you're stupid. Fuck you too. I've killed more cunts than cervical cancer. Holy shit. Expletive this developer exploiting as ass game, don't exploiting, don't buy it, don't exploiting, even don't even think about it, exploiting this game, blah, blah, hell mean, really this game is exploiting and that's all I have there is to it. What? Okay, sure, you're angry, I get that, but what? And my personal favorite, I'm going to kill you. Really? Really? That's who we are on the internet? Those are from both game developers and game fans. I am not picking on any one particular group at all. Those are from people who both make games and play games. We are better than that. We are all better than that. And I get it. We're angry, we're passionate about what we're doing, and we don't like what's happening in the industry. We don't like that certain games are happening. We don't like that certain other games should happen and don't because they don't have funding. I get it, that's fine. Whining on the internet, making gross overgeneralizations on the internet, making death threats on the internet is not the way to change that. It is not the way to get your point heard, people. All that does is make you sound like a goddamn idiot. And then you, people just tune you out, even if you had a fantastic point to make after that. It doesn't matter because everyone else is like, you're dumb. And to some extent, yes, don't do that. You know what you can do? Do something, get off the goddamn internet. Stop crusading with your keyboard and do something. Oh, well, I don't have a big name. I can't do anything. Fuck you. Yes, you can. Just because you can't go to the UN, it doesn't mean you still can't do anything. Can you code? Can you design? Go make a game about what you think should be there. Go make that happen. Why well, can't do that? Great. There's other things you can do. Do you actually work for a developer as something else? Go, I don't, you don't like your company culture? Change it. Go befriend the new employees and make the culture you want to see in your company. You have that power as a developer. Whining about it isn't going to do anything. In fact, the change you want to see. Okay, you don't work as a developer. That's fine too. There's more things you can do. Are you really good at playing games? You can affect change. There's this thing called Extra Life. You can play games to raise money to give money to um, kids with diseases. That's super powerful and all you have to do is play games. Literally on November 7th, go do it. If you're good at playing games, go raise some money for these people. 
You're not good at playing games. That's fine too, you can still do things. Go to an IGDA meeting and go talk to an Indian, offer support, be a mentor. Just look at their game and be like, good job, keep it up. That is extremely powerful, just hearing that little yay, and then that gives them, you know, an Indian developer just you know, the steam to go on for the next week. You can do that. Oh, that's still too hard. Jesus Christ. Okay, you know what? There's still something else you can do. The minute before you push that stupid enter button on your keyboard, the minute before you say send, maybe you try this one little thing called empathy. Think about the other person on the other side of that screen for just one tiny little second and look at what you just wrote and then maybe try empathizing just a little bit. Who is that person? Who am I just insulting? Who am I just saying I'm gonna kill? And then maybe if we all just exercise a teeny weeny weeny little bit of empathy as a developer, as a fan, as just a goddamn human being, we can just make everything a tiny little better, more happy place full of unicorn tears and glitter farts, okay? Just a little bit. And if that's still too much for you, get off the goddamn fucking internet. I'm tired of reading it. Ugh.